My name is Keith Hoyland from RPI. I want to thank you for attending the time to attend this webinar on R&I for Finance. I'm uh, very excited about our presenter today because it's me. I had to beg profusely to be allowed to finally do one of these webinars. And I'm very excited to deliver something that I uh, hopefully have some valuable information to share. R&I for Finance uh, is the topic today. You guys already know about RPI, been around for a long time. We like taking pictures quite a bit, and we also like talking about ourselves. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We're going to cover the foundations necessary to answer some deep questions about R&I. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to answer those deep questions. And once we have that momentum going and we've reached the pinnacle of R&I enlightenment, we're going to dive deeper down the rabbit hole to talk about inventory transactions and other matching transactions and invoice tolerance. And we'll see how this goes. This is the debut of this presentation, so hopefully it goes smoothly. First of all, let's define R&I. For anybody that does not know, R&I stands for receive not invoice. And technically, receive not invoice is a phase in the procure to pay cycle. We have requested some goods, we have ordered them, and we have received them. We may have even received and entered an invoice, but we have not matched it. The focus today is on the financial representation of this phase. So if you like T accounts, you're in good luck. All right, let's start with the foundational keys to understanding R&I. Number one, and most important thing you can learn today is that the foundation of P2P GL postings is the AP175. Non-stocks, services, specials are all defined by the invoice. Why are they defined by the invoice? Because the invoice controls what we actually paid for the goods. It doesn't matter at the end of the day what we put in a PO, it matters what got approved for the check that got cut out the door. So the PO is gonna provide us with some very useful information, namely the who and the what, which will tell us where to put it in our income statement, but it's gonna tie directly to the amount that we paid based on the approved invoice that gets paid. AP175 is the foundation of all P2P postings. We'll repeat this a few times and we'll walk through it. So then, what is the PO receipt accrual, right? PO receipt accrual is an accrual of these non-stocks and specials that are gonna be defined by the AP175 but produced by PO, right? So it's just a temporary estimate. Since I don't have the match invoice to post, I have this nice data set on the PO line that gives me an educated guess. Maybe it's off. Maybe it's a $10,000 item that says one, but it's the best that I have, that unit cost and that quantity. So the PO135 is an automated way to leverage the data in my PO line table to generate a month in accrual, something that I could do manually. And we're gonna talk about why that's useful. And lastly, we're going to talk about inventory transactions. Because when you look at all these accounts in your matching table or matching company or your ICO4 GL category, if everything is defined by the invoice, then there ultimately are very few exceptions. Why do we have all these accounts? Well, we have all these accounts because inventory items are very ornery and require a lot of maintenance and have a lot of scenarios that have to be addressed. Okay, good so far? Awesome. AP175. AP175 is the AP posting program for all fully approved invoices. What if the invoice has a message? What if it's a PO invoice and it has a message? Then it will not post because uh, it won't be approved. What if it's missing receipts? Then it won't match and it won't post. What if there's an invoice entry error? Then it won't process and it won't post. Now, how does AP know where to post the distributions? AP175 grabs the distributions from the AP Distrib table. In a case of a match invoice, AP Distrib is pulling that information from the PO line based on what we put in the invoice detail, right? Invoice grabs that information, populates the AP Distrib. Obviously, we can front code some stuff, and that's what the AP175 is going to post. The other side of that posting is a recognition of that AP liability. So basically, we spent $100 on X and Y, and we owe $100. Does the AP175 care about the dollars on the PO? It 
It doesn't. It doesn't go look at the PO. It doesn't matter if this PO right here is for a dollar or 10,000. All it cares about is what we actually approve to pay. Now to finish that out, and I'm sure most of you already know this, the AP 170, which closes the payment cycle, clears our AP liability, which comes from the AP company, and reduces our cash on hand and our bank account, right, which is represented in the cash code. If there's a discount, it gets taken at this point, right? So net net, we register some expenses and we lose some cash. Okay, that's super straightforward, but we're gonna come back to it. Let's talk about the PO 135 and what the PO 135 does. Uh, PO 135 is going to query the PO line table for any unmatched received quantities. Now that's sort of a simple way of saying it, right, because it's a little bit more complex. It's going to take the received quantity on the PO line minus the match quantity minus the archive quantity and whatever's left over, it's going to multiply times the unit cost on the PO to generate this accrual, right? Where is it getting these AU and account distributions from? It's getting them from that PO line. It's a guess, it's not an actual, but it's our best guess. It's a good estimate, right? Or the best estimate we can produce. And on the flip side, it's gonna accrue that in this PO receipt accrual account, which is set up in your match company at the very top. Now, very important, two very important things. One is this generates this auto reversing entry for non-stocks and specials. And we'll talk about that in a second because the PO 135 does list the inventory items that fall within its criteria, but doesn't generate any GL postings based off of them. This is just a simple month end posting that sums up all the N type and X type items. Now, the other important thing is that it is an auto reversing entry, right? If we think of it accrual, and accrual is an estimate. So it makes perfect sense that we're gonna reverse it the following month. That reversal is based on what? Is this reversal based on the PO line? No. Is it based on an AP invoice? No. This reversal is 100% based on the accrual, right? It was an outer reversing entry. When you close the period, it generates that reversal and it's going to copy that exact accrual. It does not matter what happens in your PO subsystem in between, between the time that you did the accrual and the time that the reversing entry takes place. Hopefully that makes perfect sense. It's important when we start to answer questions, right? Derived from the month and JE. Now, most organizations run the PO 135, um, but it is an optional program, right? It's generating an accrual and it is not critical to fulfill an order or to pay an invoice. You could theoretically not run the PO 135. So let's talk about why it's a wonderful thing. Right? What the PO 135 is allowing us to do is to smooth out expenses and to better allocate them to the month of usage. Right? So let's take a simple example. Let's say that um, I'm a department in an organization and I want to start ordering uh, these new items that are going to help me do my job better. And so I go down to purchasing and we negotiate a contract with a vendor and we set them up and I start requesting these items. We start placing those orders. Month of January, um, we start ordering, but I don't run the PO 135 and I don't have an invoice. No invoice comes in in January, right? It's just my month of ordering. So at the end of the month, without an accrual, I get zero dollars against my budget in spite of the fact that I have been ordering these goods. Month two, it turns out they start sending invoices, but they have the wrong address. We never get them. We don't even know. Month three, they start asking questions. They're like, we're not getting paid. We discover they have the wrong address. They get the right address. They resend them, but we're missing W9 information. So our IP department puts that on hold and asks them to get it for them. Month of April, they refuse to ship goods. They say, until I get paid, you're not getting anything else. We all get together. AP processes all the invoices for January, February, March, and April. And what happens? $40,000 worth of invoices get posted that month. AP 175 drives a $40,000 expense. 
right? So we have this hiccup. I mean, this is a terrible way to try to manage your budget. Maybe I don't even know that this new item I'm purchasing 10,000 of. How would I know that, right? So let's look at the same exact scenario with the PO135. At the end of that first month, I don't have an invoice, but the goods I've ordered and received, the PO135 will generate an accrual, temporary out of reversing entry for $10,000. Now, is that what I'll actually spend? I don't know, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30, but it's something, it's an estimate, and as the sample size gets bigger, the more useful it becomes. I get to February, again, they're sending the invoices to the wrong address, but now I have an outer reversing entry from January at the beginning, and I have $20,000 worth of PO line to accrue. And what's the net effect? Another $10,000 estimate that goes straight to my department expense. Again, it outer reverses, but at the end of March, I have 30,000. And when April comes and we do the big invoice cleanup, the AP 175 does post $40,000 worth of transactions in that one month, but there's the outer reversal from March that offsets it. So you see what happened here? It smoothed out. Now let's say our pricing was wrong and our coolers were wrong, and this was really $30,000, we'd have 10, 10, 10, and zero. Let's say it was $50,000. We'd have 10, 10, 10, and 20. Either way, I think we can all agree that it's helpful smoothing it out. This is something that can be done manually, you know? The PO135 is just facilitating for this for us. It's one of the benefits of having an integrated system, of having this procurement data as part of your financial system. Okay, so hopefully everybody's following so far. If not, definitely ping. We are ready for our first question. Can you show me the journal entry with the RNI that was removed? I cannot show you the journal entry with the RNI that was removed because there was no journal entry to remove RNI. RNI accrual auto reversed, and if we correct it or addressed or matched those received lines, they won't accrue at month end. It's important. I can't tell you how many times I got in this question. Just show me the journal entry. There's no journal entry. It's an accrual. Okay. Moving on. All right, so now we get to get into the fun stuff, right? Because inventory is not like the others. And if you guessed that this dude's inventory, you were totally correct, right? So at a base level, the PO line doesn't have the department the goods are intended for, right? When we order an inventory item, it's an asset for the company that's gonna be used by a location to be determined. Right? When we order non stocks and specials, it's specifically for a whom and we know what. But in the case of an inventory item, we don't know its final destination. Right? Basically a company asset for future use uh, and we need to recognize that asset and we need to value that so that we are able to issue it to a department that uses it. So let's look at that. I think one way to think about it is uh, the inventory receipt draws a line in the sand. So at the point that it's released in PO30, the IC130 is gonna post updates to the inventory, uh, to the inventory GL balance, and to the PO receipt accrual account. This is technically not an accrual, right? This is not an outer reversing estimate. This is something that's gonna get cleared at some point by an actual journal entry, hopefully from AP. Right, this inventory balance is gonna to post to comes from the GL category that the item is tied to, the item location, IC12 record, required for it to be an inventory item. And the PO receipt accrual is gonna come from your match company. Okay, so far so good, right? Now, at this point in the sand, from one end, it eventually finds a home. Somebody requests it or an issue is entered, and that department gets charged for consuming those goods, which reduces our inventory balance. AU department could come from the requesting location. The expense account comes from the GL category. On the flip side, we're reducing our inventory balance. Okay. On the other side, the payment is processed, right? So when the invoice is entered into AP20, MA43, does it charge the department an account? No. It clears 
the PO receipt accrual. So for inventory items, when we process that invoice, what the AP 175 does is it moves that liability from the PO receipt accrual to AP, right? So inventory items and non-stocks could not be more different in terms of how these postings behave. And it's very important when we're looking to address issues with R&I or to explain why it's working the way it is. Now, that PO invoice, similar to our non-stocks and specials, when it gets paid, is gonna clear the AP liability and reduce our GL uh, bank account representation or cash code. Okay, let's look at this whole thing from a high level, right? In the case of non-stocks and specials, we cut all this out and this department expense ties to this AP liability. It's one transaction from the AP 175, accruals notwithstanding. In the case of an inventory receipt, it starts off with two balance sheet accounts, the asset and the liability. The asset eventually turns into an expense and the liability turns into a reduction in cash. At the end of the day, we spend $100 and this is what we spent the hundred dollars on. All right, so this is IC 130, IC 130, AP 175, and AP 170. Okay, so I think we're ready for our second question. Why doesn't the PO 135 match the balance in my PO receipt accrual account? So this is another question I get often. So I think that the first thing that we need to understand is the PO135 is generating a month in accrual for non-stocks and specials, and I have yet to see that number not match. So if you have that, please send it my way. It'd be very special. We might frame it here in RPI offices. What people are generally referring to is the listing of inventory items doesn't match the remainder of the balance sitting in that PO receipt accrual account. I think it's very important to understand that it's just a listing. It's a report. It's a snapshot in time. It's a query. All those postings were generated by the IC130. And if you want to know where they're coming from, you can save the IC130 every day, and I guarantee you it matches every single posting that's gone in there, and the AP175 matches every single AP posting that's come out. <coughs> in fact, I've actually seen organizations that they run the IC130 at the end of the month, and the AP175 at the end of the month, neither one of which is best practice, nor do I recommend, but you know what they get? They get accounts that reconcile perfectly, right? Because it runs one time and they can point to the IC130 and say, this is my transaction. And they can point to the AP175 and say, this is my transaction. So the, the, the PO135 is not meant to be a reconciliation item for your RNI balance. It is a snapshot of the PO line table and it generates only that month in accrual. It's the only thing that should match. Now, I understand that in theory, we want what the IC130 uh, is posting to match what the PO135 is doing, but there's a lot of things that can occur where that snapshot doesn't match the sum of those postings. Okay, ready for a third question? You guys can throw in your own too. Why does the RNI balance keep growing? Right, so we talked about what feeds this PO receipt accrual. PO 135, the query of non-stocks and specials, and the IC 130, inventory receipts. So at the simplest level, if your r &I balance is growing, it's because you have more received, not matched, dollars in your PO system, right? Now, why that is might take a little bit of digging. Maybe you actually have growing liabilities to your vendors. Maybe you're growing. Maybe you haven't been paying your vendors and you don't know it. Or you have issues with your P2P processes that are creating this data subset that is generating this financial postings, right? You're receiving uh, items in error. Your, uh, these are some of the common things we see, right? Your invoices are getting processes, not PO, therefore not clearing the receipt line. You're creating duplicate POs. You have some unit measure conversions. And standing on blanket orders, you know, loss of has functionality that works pretty well, but many of us use the PO20 as sort of a never-ending add-on, and it tends to have a disproportionate amount of junk. Okay. On a roll here, fourth question. How much RNI is okay? Well, it's basically a weighted average of the delta between the receipt and the invoice approval, right? So, most of these things will have quick turnaround between the time they come in and the time the payment is processed, 
But some will take a little bit of time, right? You'll have stragglers where there's matching issues and it takes time for people to look through and research and get around to. I would say two weeks of purchase dollars is reasonable. So if you look at your average monthly spend and you RNIs half of that, I think you're okay. If you have anything over a month, that's gonna equal significant opportunity. Now, a lot of this depends on organization and setup. Yeah, we do have one question, Keith. <laughs> question number one, uh, how far back can you run an RNI report? So the PO135 is going to grab everything that it finds when it queries. And I, I think this fits right into my next slide, which is I recommend fighting the tyranny of machines. So I'm going to answer that question in just a second. Let me give a little bit of a, a prefix up. When we go do RNI cleanups, we often find that there are lines that have been accruing nonstop for 15 years, 16 years. They say 2001, 2000, 1999. Now, I don't know for a fact that that is not a valid receipt for which an invoice is still missing, but I can tell you it's highly unlikely. And given that it's highly unlikely, we shouldn't be accruing it. Very interesting experience, probably a lot of you uh, use drop ships. Uh, maybe those of you in healthcare use them for after the fact items where you're using the item and then you're creating the PO uh, to be invoiced. And since it doesn't go through a receiving dock, receiving becomes a problem, so you use the drop ship flag. So I had a customer with this issue, and they started using dropships, and they were very happy. But then, you guys remember our example there with not running the PO135? That happened to them. These expenses spiked in one month, and the question was why. And when they did a little bit of digging, they found that a lot of invoices had been processed for that one vendor in that one month. So we suggested that they could accrue it, right? The PO135 can't grab that receipt line data because there's no receiver in it, but you could run an Excel add-ins query and you could get that information for all the PO dropship invoices for this type of item and you could just generate a manual out of reversing entry, right? Real simple. They called me back six months later and this is where it got really, really interesting. They said, um, we see that these lines are from six months ago. Are they valid? Well, I didn't know. We didn't know, right? Somebody would have to research. They might be valid. They might not. And here's what they said. They said, well, we feel like a reasonable accrual is 90 days. How do you feel about that? I felt great, right? It's an accrual. It's an estimate. At the point in time that human judgment was forced in, 90 days became reasonable. And yet, with the PO135, it has stuff from 2001, and nobody blinks an eye. I don't think you can get any human being to say that that is a reasonable estimate of the true liability that the company has, especially if it's significant, but it's auto-generated by Lawson, right? There's a safety net there. So I would say, uh, you know, fight the tyranny of ma machines. Uh, it, it's just a system. So the P135 is going to grab a bunch of dates. So another question here, which you kind of just mentioned too. Um, if we have vendors that are net 45, then is 60 days a good measure for R&I? So the term should not affect um, R&I, right? Because R&I is not based on payment, it's based on posting of the invoice. So the invoice, as soon as it's matched and the AP-175 is run, you get your representation of this expense on your income statement. The line is matched on the PO line and the PO-135 won't accrue. So terms should not affect the balance of your R&I. One more here on the, the whole turning machines is that I, I feel like sometimes we expect Lawson to be a, almost a sentient being, right? It's, a, it's just a computer system. It's a you know, bunch of tables and batch jobs, and it does whatever you feed it, right? It can't evaluate whether that data is reasonable or not, right? At least at this point, it doesn't have that artificial intelligence gene. Uh, had a situation a long time ago with, uh, with some reams of paper, units of measure got all screwed up and it was like $3 million for a small order of paper. And I was asked how Lawson could possibly value it at $3 million. Well, Lawson has no idea. Lawson doesn't even know what paper is, right? Lawson knows there's an item. Lawson knows the price that it's given and a series of queries and batch jobs run, pull that data and post it. Okay, fifth deep question. How do we clean it up? <laughs> um, 
So that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of variance, I think, and there's a lot of options uh, that we've seen. A lot of it's going to depend on the skills, size uh, of your organization, um, how much, right? And I think one important thing is to distinguish between process and cleanup. Everybody should have an RNI process. There's no reason to let garbage data accumulate. It's not healthy for your system. Uh, it has downward consequences on all your reports, not just your accruals. Uh, when lines don't close, purchase order headers don't close. When purchase order headers don't close, they show up on your queries, they show up on the open PO report. But usually, when we look at um, any level of cleanup, it's because the balance has gotten really high, Accountants are asking questions, and then the organization gets galvanized to try to address it. So, uh, two different things. One is establish a regular RNI maintenance process. Definitely should have one. Uh, who is responsible for RNI cleanup? Well, I think that AP and purchasing both need to share responsibilities. And typically, what I like to see is one side of the organization is doing the research, and one side of the organization is responsible for cleaning it up. I think it's very important to just know what your balance is. Do you know what your balance is right now? Do you know what your balance is over 90 days? You can CSV, you can query the PO line table directly. Um, when you do develop a process, because it's a recurring thing, you want to make sure that you have a good feedback loop where you're not researching the same lines over and over again. And I think you want to prioritize um, high dollars and you want to be organized, right? If you're going to call a vendor, call a vendor with all the open POs you have and they don't have any of those POs open, it's probably not valid RNI. Um, and obviously, look for patterns. You know, I, I think you can look for patterns later as long as you have a footprint on what got cleaned up. For one time cleanup, <laughs> I think the biggest thing is establishing agent dollar parameters. I, I think it's a big waste of time to go research a lot of stuff that's old. Uh, you know, it's probably not a real liability. If you have 100 RNI lines or 100,000 and one of those, or a thousand are legitimate, it's easier to deal with the exception of those coming in later. There are ways to work around that. You can have purchasing approve it. You can code it on the invoice. You can put the PO number and have it linked then to research those 100,000 lines. It'll take forever, right? If you are gonna research some stuff, focus on high dollars and those that tie into construction and progress um, because they might be part of longer term things and because they have more impact on the financial side. And there's many different ways. You can paint screen, you can use archiving programs to automate some of this, or you can go the more traditional route of trying to back out receivers or, or matching them. Common sense, super helpful. Okay. All right, now we start to get a more fun question. This cleanup is resulting in a large balance sheet reduction, right? Because I have a liability that I've been building up for a lot of years that now is gonna come down where should this gain go? I, I think this is a really great question. Um, and I think that the MA180 uh, write-off actually offers us a very interesting uh, and, 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 and good option, right? Because if you think about, um, if you think about this PO receipt accrual that you are cleaning up, especially when it comes to non-stocks and specials. So at some point in 2001, uh, we received the item and it didn't get invoiced in that very first month. And so what happened? It accrued at the end of the month, right? So there was a pure receipt accrual and a department expense. And the net at the end of that month was that it, it basically created a hit against that department, right? And what happened that second month is there was a reversing entry and then there was a reaccrual. And so from a department expense perspective, it netted to zero, right? So February 2001, there was a $100 hit to the department. And every other month since, 15 years and however many months, it's basically been a net of zero. And so if we were to back out this receiver, right, or close it and stop this accrual, we would have the outer reversing entry, but not the accrual, right? So it reduce our PO receipt accrual balance, our liability, but who would it credit? It would credit that department. And does it really make sense to give a department a credit in 2016 for erroneous receipt in 2001? And uh, in my opinion, it does not. So it's interesting to look at what the MA180 does, right? The MA180 
hard codes the department expense and then writes off the amount. So you have the reversing entry for the month in which you've closed it, right? No longer have an accrual. And then you run this in write-off. You hard code this expense. This is not out of reversing. And you clear it against the write-off account, right? So the department expense is still zero. And you have this other account on your income statement that's basically recognizing these gains were part of an effort to clean up past data. I like that. You don't have to use the MA1A to do that. You can journalize that, right? There's many different ways to handle it, but that is, that is how the MA180 write-off works. And the MA180 is pulling that from the receipt write-off and inventory receipt archival accounts on the MA01.1. Uh, okay, now that we're warmed up with some T account action, let's go further down the inventory matching GL rabbit hole. We're gonna look at match not received, item cost variance, which is actually super cool, uh, inventory adjustments, and the infamous invoice tolerance account. Okay, starting with match not received. So match rece not received is kind of the opposite of R&I, right? We've matched an invoice uh, in excess of what we've received, uh, uh, and we've approved it for payment, right? So the AP175 has to post these dollars. If we received 80, what we think are $80 worth, and we paid 100, we gotta pay 100, and it's actually not a problem for Knox and Specialists, because I, I know the whom what, I just grab that from that same PO line, and I charge that department $100. Now, Lawson does track that as an MNR quantity on the PO line, and we're gonna talk about why in a second. Um, but in the case of inventory items, it's gonna post that MNR access to an MNR balance sheet account, right? And we're gonna talk about, about why that is, okay? So it's the reverse of R&I, right? So when we have R&I, we have AP clear a PO receipt accrual that got created by that inventory receipt. But in the case of MNR, there is no PO receipt accrual to clear because there wasn't a receipt for that. So instead, I'm gonna place that balance in the MNR account. Now think about it. I can't have the invoice drive an increase in my inventory value. It's not gonna increase my stock on hand. So this is really just a placeholder until what? Until I enter the receipt in for that excess amount that I paid, right? And then it's gonna do the reverse of the PO receipt accrual. That receipt, instead of generating a PO receipt accrual because there's an MNR quantity on the PO line, is gonna clear the MNR account. So it's kind of the same thing in reverse and everything else washes out, right? The, the inventory that got received gets issued to departments. The invoice gets processed and paid. And at the end of the day, just like in reverse, I have $100 spent and I have those $100 allocated on my income statement. Please. Uh, the question is, if we run MA180, how far back should we write off these items? Six months, a year, three years? So that, so that is a question that depends on every organization. But I, I would write off anything that's over a year old, in my opinion, if it was my decision, no problem. And maybe, maybe more recent than that, depending on how uh, good I felt about my AP department and the cleanliness of that data. I, I see very common to, to write off everything in your post. And I, I just wanna make, I just wanna make uh, one thing really clear here, because uh, I, know, I know I said it, but just to repeat it is, you're not writing it off because you're saying it's 100% invalid. You're saying 99% of it is invalid, and I'm gonna deal with the stuff that comes in, which I think makes sense. All right, so this is sort of a bird's eye view. Um, now let's look, at, let's look at that flow here uh, with an example, right? So I have, uh, an initial receipt, this is, this is more often how it works, right? Because you don't match against nothing. I have an initial receipt for five boxes at $20 per, and it creates that initial PO receipt accrual inventory uh, transaction. When the invoice comes in, it comes in for $140. It can only clear 100 of the PO receipt accrual because that's all that's in there for this receipt and it's gonna post the other 40 to the MNR account. And then when I do my second receipt, it's gonna increase the inventory by 40 and it's gonna clear that MNR account. This is just, these MNR and PO receipt accrual are basically passed through, pass through accounts. Okay, so let's talk about um, 
the MNR write-off, which many of you guys have seen as well. So basically, the MNR write-off is when we're saying we paid for it, but it was kind of an organizational mistake. We shouldn't have. We never got it. So in the case of something that got charged to the department, under the assumption that the department was going to get in and accept it, we basically give them a credit, right? The write-off clears the MNR quantity. Uh, it goes to the MNR write-off account and it gives the department a credit. We erroneously paid for or charged them for something they didn't get. In the case of inventory items, obviously, um, it's going to clear the M&R account where that balance is holding. Make sure I uh, let people see the screen here. Okay, and those accounts come from the MA01 company, match write-off, Match not received. Match not received is the balance sheet holding the excess quantities for the inventory items. And match write-off is when we clear those MNR quantities uh, through a write-off, which I generally wouldn't recommend doing. I think it's just when you have MNR quantities, is you don't have a process by which people are receiving the things after the invoice uh, quantity message has been approved. OK. Item cost variance. Super cool. It only applies to inventory items. Why? Because there is no variance with non-stocks and specials. Whatever we pay on the invoice is what we post. It always ties to itself. There is a variance sometimes between inventory items because at the time of receipt, we need to make an estimate of what it's worth and what do we use. We don't have the invoice, we use what's on the PO line. So if the PO line says a dollar, we post at a dollar. Now sometimes that invoice comes in for a different amount, a dollar and nine cents. And so we try to pass back those nine cents to IC to see if we can't revalue that item if it's still there, right? Now that we know that the price was something else, can we get it fixed? So let's take a look at how this works. Receipt comes in for 100 each is at $5, right? PO30 released, IC130 is gonna post $500 to the balance, uh, the inventory balance, and $500 to the PO receipt or cool. Hopefully I'm not putting everyone to sleep here. <laughs> when the invoice comes in, it comes in for 100 each is at $6, right? So our pricing was wrong, potentially, right? And assuming that that amount gets approved, the AP175 is gonna create a $600 AP liability because that's how much money's going out the door, but it's only gonna have 500 to clear from the PO receipt accrual, right? It's gonna take the other $100 that delta, and it's gonna post it to this item cost variance suspense. Again, this is a pass-through account, should be a balance sheet account. I just, yeah, just give me, give me a second here. Then the IC130 is gonna clear that variance. If the inventory is there, it's gonna revalue the inventory. It's gonna say, make these 100 worth $6 each. If the inventory has been issued, and Lawson actually tracks this at the lot level, so like in, in uh, first in, first out, it knows how much of that receipt it's allocated to go out. This is even if you use average costing, it's very cool. Um, it's gonna write it off to that cost variance account that you find in the ICO for. Or third, probably more common option, is some of that inventory's been issued out and some of it's still on hand, in that case, it's going to revalue the inventory that's still there. There's still six. There's still enough to address 60, and the difference it's going to write off. Yes, sir. All right. So we have two questions. One uh, encouraging comment. Uh, the encouraging comment is that they're not asleep. They're discussing <laughs> the feasibility. They're discussing the feasibility of actually linking this video every month uh, <laughs> the, while they're closing and posting the PO135. Awesome. Uh, I hope this is helpful, and I, I'm hoping we get a good recording so that it can be out there for, for a long time. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, where do these accounts come from? Item cost variance accounts. The suspense comes from the match company, right? It's uh, second line. And the cost variance comes from the GL category, right? So by cost variance, it's if the inventory item is no longer there, no longer on hand, we're going to write it off. It, it, Lawson can't get to the point to chase down the department to which it was issued and reissue that. But if the difference is significant, that is something you can do 
manually with some inventory adjustments. So you can, um, you can basically take it back, change the value in IC24, and then, and then put it out. This is very basic. IC24 is just moving inventory quantities up, up and down. Um, and basically it's gonna offset the inventory balance change from with the inventory adjustment account, which is also on the ICO4. Sometimes um, we use this to revalue uh, the, the unit cost of an item in our storeroom. Uh, it's quantity, but you could take it down to zero as long as you don't have anything allocated. And then you could put it up at the right value. And basically that differential ends up in the adjustment account, um, which I personally think is awesome because basically when in doubt, all these inventory screw ups get fixed in different places, but all rows lead to that inventory adjustment account. And that is, uh, that is a nice um, presentation for another day. <laughs> so let's hit one last big account, the fun one, um, the invoice tolerance account. So it's interesting because non-stocks and specials, there is no variance, right? The invoice is the actual, so there's no need for a tolerance account. And in the case of inventory items, we're revaluing from inventory, and so, and we have this uh, item, uh, item cost variance expense account to do that with. So why do we need, why do we need an invoice tolerance? Where does an invoice tolerance come into play? Well, it comes into place in two places. One is, we may match inventory items within tolerance. And when we do, Lawson is saying, well, I don't know if this is really the value of the inventory item. All I know is that the organization chose not to spend the time to check it because it was only a penny or two pennies or nine cents and they just didn't care. So instead of going and revaluing that item, I'm just gonna write it off to this tolerance account. And that's why when you look at that account, it usually says one cent, two cent, one cent, two cent, and it's pretty insignificant. Actually, I'll take that back. Usually nobody looks at that account because it's very insignificant. The only times that people look at that account is because it's an AP balancing account. So once you go through the match process, there's certain things that happen to populate other accounts. And it's almost like an error suspense. If the AP invoice distributions don't match the invoice total, Lawson at the end of all these programs says, just post it to this uh, invoice tolerance account. So it's not so much representative of an action when you see the big dollars, as it is representative of you found sort of a a glitch in the matrix, a gap, and it's using it to address it, and these tend to be very high dollars. Luckily, I have a great example that we can look at today. Um, it's an invoice for $2,222.64. Uh, in order for this invoice to process at any level, the AP distributions have to equal the invoice total, right? Um, but what happened in this particular scenario, and I've seen this happen more than a few times, and this is a recreatable scenario, not just a hiccup, uh, is we had a PO for quantity of one at 2222.54, so off by like 10 cents, and we entered the invoice in at a quantity of 84 for uh, $26.46. Now, um, I like to distribute wherever I can a screenshot of something like this with a big no and say don't approve this, send it back. The tendency is I'm a buyer, I go, that's the same thing, man. It's the same thing. This is a case, those are the eaches, this invoice is good to go. And I totally understand that temptation, but it leaves kind of a train wreck behind that somebody else is gonna have to clean up or potentially someone like me comes in, not free. So you just wanna send this back. But it does happen. Okay, so it creates two messages in fact. It creates one for quantity and it creates one for cost. Let's see if this whole thing is working here today. Okay, so from PO invoice detail. All right, so the quantity gets approved. And Lawson says, okay, so we received one, but we paid for 84, and that's an MNR quantity of 83. That's basic math, right? And I need to create a distribution for that quantity of 83 to the MNR account, and each one of these is worth 2,222.54. And therefore, 
I need to post $184,470.80 to that MNR account. Now you and I, people, we know that doesn't make sense for an invoice that total, but Lawson's just following the basic math that that program's selling it to do. Then it says, okay, you approve the cost, so I gotta post to the item cost variance to revalue that one we did receive to $26.46, which is a differential of $2,196.08. But right before it flips that flag to approve so that it can post, it notices this is out of balance, and it, yeah, <laughs> it does this. This is actually in the COBOL program. It posted to the number of tolerance account. So whenever you see that big posting, basically something happened where Lawson did the math it was supposed to and everything got out of whack, right? And it's usually something like that crisscross and there you have the posting. And my recommendation to handle this is to do a MA75 PO invoice cancel. It's not gonna take back the invoice. You know, you can reverse match if you catch it in time. Usually that's not the case because you wouldn't see the posting if you didn't catch it in time. Uh, but it's gonna, it's gonna create a credit that offsets these things exactly, right? It's gonna be the same invoice number with a 999 iteration, offset all the stuff exactly, and then you're gonna wanna re-enter that invoice, maybe put a period at the end, um, and match it correctly. This is the kind of stuff that I actually get calls for. It's got $180,000 invoice tolerance. All right. So in summary, RNI is awesome. <coughs> P to PGL postings are super simple. AP175 defines them all, except for inventory items. They're ornery and they require a lot of fancy matching accounts. <laughs> and the irony is they tend to not be the high value dollar items either, just the ones that cause a lot of work. MNR is the opposite RNI. And, and invoice tolerance, if you see anything in there that's not a few cents, it's a balancing item, a series of transactions that confuse loss. So I'll, I'll take some questions if anybody has them. Uh, I'll point out that uh, uh, the marketing team is pushing social media. Please join us in all these various things. I'm not even sure what all these icons are. LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Instagram. Instagram, jumpy guy. What is this? That's Instagram. Oh. Uh, digital Concourse, and Digital Concourse also, we have a nice presence on Digital Concourse. And I've been asked to plug a webinar June 23rd, Easy Guide to New York City. Uh, this is Foreign Forum, we hope that you guys will make it, look forward to seeing you there, our PI is going to have a big presence. I encourage all of you to stop by, we're, we're taking a lot of consultants, I know that's not the standard, but uh, basically look at it as an opportunity to get free consulting, come ask us your questions. There's some really talented people at RPI that are happy to help and it's a good time to meet them, they're going to be there. Uh, we can arrange meetings with them if you want for the different subject matter areas. And questions, you'll notice that, um, see that name there is not mine. Okay. So, uh, yes, please. So, we do have a few questions. Uh, question number one How do you archive an inventory receipt that has been partially matched to an invoice? So, you should be able to archive an inventory receipt that is partially matched to an invoice. I, I'm assuming I'm getting the question because you've tried and you've run into issues. So, let me just, let me just. Couple of quick things here. Um, generally speaking, when we have uh, 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 problems with archiving, most of Lawson's archiving programs are based off the receipt line table. Um, anytime you have data that you're tracking in parallel, anytime at all, even if it's a single platform and everything should work perfectly, you're bound to have issues. And this happens in Lawson a lot, where the PO line does not match the receipt line exactly. And so you might go to archive it and it's not there to archive, but it's still accruing, or maybe you did archive and it's still accruing. That is a mismatch and that can happen. And at the end of the day, um, to fix this type of issue, you almost always have to resort to some level of paint screen. Uh, you know, if you want to feel safe about it, you let Info Extreme run through it and let them be the ones to tell you. That's what you need to do. But um, you know, that, that's one way. That's one way to fix it. I will say with inventory items, if you paint screen, just make sure that you're doing the corresponding journal entry to clear that PO receipt accrual. Okay. Uh, did you say that the item cost variance account and the invoice tolerance account should be balance sheet accounts? So yes, on the on the first, the item cost variance suspense account. I believe should be a balance sheet because it's a pass-through. Every single penny that AP puts in there, uh, IC is going to clear. And it's going to distribute to either revalue the inventory or to write off. Now, when you do month ends, you know, maybe there's stuff that went from AP that IC130 hasn't cleared. So maybe you should have a balance. 
that balance is generally not very significant. If it is significant, it means an invoice price came in for something that was totally out of whack with a PO. In the case of an inventory item, that usually means that there's some underlying issues, some misking, uh, or so forth. The invoice tolerance account should be, a, should be a, a, an expense account, right? It's, it's not coming out of there, it's just posting there. So this is for inventory items that are matched with intolerance, it's just like, as an organization, we didn't care, we just wrote it off, it's a write-off account. And it's also, it's a, I call it a balancing item, like that error suspense, but it's not really a balance sheet account. I, I think you'll notice that the big dollars come in and then, then you address them, but yeah. Okay. Matter of opinion there, I guess, yeah. So last question. She got a question about cost variance. Can it post to the distribution account on the PO? So that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so um, inventory items don't have an accounting unit and department on the PO. They have the inventory account. And so those are the ones that get affected by cost variance, right? Because we had to declare the value of the inventory when we received it in. And when the invoice came in, there was a discrepancy. And we're trying to revalue it, but it's gone. So we're writing it off. In the case of a non-stock and special, so in the case of your question, it always posts to the accounting unit and the account on the PO. In the case of non-stock and special, I hold on to that who and what no matter what. And I say, whatever we pay, I'm posting it their way. So it doesn't matter if the PO is for a dollar and the invoice was for a thousand. If I approve a thousand, there is no $990 cost variance. There is one single thousand dollar posting to whatever the PO distribution was, regardless of what the PO cost was. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that does it for questions too. All right, well, I would appreciate everyone attending. Hopefully this was uh, helpful and useful. Hope to see you back at 2.30. We have Mr. Chris Gordon talking about asset management and I hope you have a great afternoon.